Thanks, thanks very much. It's hard to imagine that was back in the 1970s. In 1981, I wrote a book based on that experience, arguing that computers were not about data processing, they were communications tools. And um, the book was a study in bad timing. My mother bought most of the copies, I think. But now it's finally happening. And in the next 45 minutes, I want to convince you of the following idea. That due to some big changes in technology, demographics, our economy, and society, we're moving into a period of very profound transformation where tinkering is not going to work anymore. And I'd like to lay out a few radical thoughts for you about what you need to do as a business or an organization to reinvent yourself for this new environment. Now let's start with the economic crisis. I mean, who would have imagined five years ago that a big theme of business books today and of magazine cover stories would be how to save capitalism, or is capitalism even savable? And these books are not being written by the, cap or by the Occupy types, they're being written by business people. Matthew Bishop, bu business editor of The Economist, written a book called The Road from Ruin. Some of you may know uh, this guy Paul Krugman, controversial economist, won a Nobel Prize, writes for the New York Times. For some reason, I've ended up on the same uh, stage speaking at the same event with him a couple of times recently. And he gets up and he says, look, when you have the meltdown of a financial industry, you get a prolonged period of slump. Japan had one in 1992. They're, they're still in a slump. So get ready for a, a couple of decades of ugliness in the global economy. And that's the good news scenario, he says. Because some really bad things can happen, like one of these big countries, Spain or Italy, defaults on its sovereign debt. Angela Merkel from Germany doesn't come in and backstop the euro. The euro collapses. Europe goes into a depression. The global economy goes into a depression. So I get up after him. The, the, I look out at the audience. Everyone's in a fetal position. And um, I say, look. Far be it from me to debate a Nobel Prize winning economist, but I have a slightly different view. I think that the future is, it's not something to be predicted, it's something to be achieved. And we can achieve a very different future than the one that Paul outlines, but to do that, we need to know what the problem is. And the problem doesn't fall within the mental model or, or, or paradigm of traditional economists who worry about things like the business cycle, where are we at in the cycle? And are we going to double dip? And should we have more stimulation or more austerity? This is not a cyclical change that you're all sitting there trying to come to grips with today. This is a secular change. This is a turning point in human history. You know what? The industrial age has finally come to an end. And all, this is the theme of my new book, um, Macro Wikinomics, the sequel to Wikinomics. Uh, for those of you who want to get the book, the best way to get it is in massive volume. <laughs> Christmas is coming soon. No, seriously. You look around today and you see a whole set of institutions of the industrial age that are at various stages of being stalled or frozen or in atrophy or, or even failing contrasted with sparkling initiatives to reinvent this industry, this institution, this organization around a new set of principles and around a new communications medium. So look at this chart. I mean, the upper left there, the Industrial Age Corporation, typified by General Motors, America's greatest company, it went bankrupt. The financial system, the core modus operandi of Wall Street almost brought down global capitalism. Has it changed? Newspapers are going away. 70 newspapers have gone bankrupt. As one youngster said to us, if the news is important, it will find me. Our systems for global problem solving can't seem to solve problems. Are these problems just too hard to solve? Or do we have an old model based on nation states and a bunch of institutions that came out of Bretton Woods in the end of the Second World War, a previous period in history. Universities and schools, each of these has an industrial model. The industrial age was an age of scale, of standardization, of production, of mass production, mass distribution, mass 
media, mass marketing, mass education. For each of these, something in the center of the top pushed out standardized units, products, newspapers, radio shows, lectures, to passive recipients. I mean, I love the university today. I mean, we have the very best model of learning that 17th century technology can provide. It's an industrial age model. It's based on the lecture. I'm a teacher, I have knowledge, you're a student, you're an empty vessel, you don't. Get ready, here it comes. And you're passive and isolated in the learning experience. To me, the lecture is the process where, the, where by the notes of a lecture go to the notes of a student without going through the brains of either. Now, now I appreciate the irony that I'm standing up here giving you a lecture. But, uh, but you know what? You're not going to... You're not going to learn much. I'm trying to convince you of a single idea. No one's going to remember the 16 institutions that need transformation or the seven business models I'm about to tell you about are the five principles for reinvention. Lecture is a good way of motivating people to do something differently, and that's my goal. So here we have the situation. Paralysis contrasted with rebirth and new opportunities. Now, for every one of these, there are lots of tough issues. I mean, the newspaper. It's going away. How do we inform ourselves as a society? How do we ensure quality and good journalism? How do we pay journalists? And how do we have balance? Right now, you can follow any point of view. Will we all end up in these little self-reinforcing echo chambers where the purpose of information is not to inform us, but perhaps it's to give us comfort? So there are a huge challenge, uh, challenges for each of these. But this is happening. now. If you want to know why this is occurring and what's going on here, again, with respect to Paul Krugman, I don't think you do go back to 1991 or 1982 or even the Great Depression. You need to go back earlier. So bear with me for a minute as we go back a few hundred years. All around the world, we had an agrarian economy. And the, and the, the means of production and political system was called feudalism, and knowledge was tightly concentrated in, in tiny oligopolies of the church and state. People didn't know about things. There was no sense of progress. You were just born, you lived your life, and you died. And then along comes Johannes Gutenberg with his great invention, and over time, people started to acquire knowledge. And when they did, the institutions of feudal agrarian society started to appear to be stalled or frozen, or an atrophy, or, or even failing. It didn't, it didn't make sense for the church to be responsible for medicine when people had knowledge. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings and nobles to be running everything. We saw the rise of parliamentary democracy, the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther called the printing press God's highest act of grace, the creation of a corporation, science, the university, Eventually, the Industrial Revolution, and it was all good. It advanced our standard of living and freedom, but it came with a cost. And now, once again, we're sitting here today trying to come to grips with the fact that the technology genie is once again out of the bottle, only this time it's very different. The printing press gave us access to the written word. The internet enables each of us to be a producer. The printing press gave us access to recorded knowledge. The internet gives us access not just to knowledge, but to the intelligence contained in the crany of other people on a global basis. This is not an information age. It's an age of networking, of human intelligence. It's an age of collaboration. Now, why is this occurring? Well, four drivers for change. First is technology. The internet of today ain't your daddy's internet. It's ubiquitous. You access it through the thing. Billions and trillions of inert objects that become smart communicated devices. My hotel room last night, the door has a chip in it. It's internetwork. The, the, the door probably has an IP address, which means that it's an internet appliance. I had a camera stolen from a hotel room in Miami, and the door knew about me. It knew who'd been in and out of the room. We found an unauthorized access. I have a friend in Toronto. Everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address, and all these things talk to each other. I have no idea what his refrigerator says to his toaster, but um, he was actually bragging that his fence talks to his sprinkler system. 
And I said, well, Ken, why would you care? He says, well, Don, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of defense. <laughs> so pervasive ambient computing, broadband mobility, remember dial-up, geospatiality. You can walk out here and you can look around with layer or Google goggles and it's a video but it's annotating. It says this is Radio City Music Hall. What do you want to know? The tourism layer? You want the commercial layer? How to book this thing? You, you want to know where the ATMs are? The old web you surfed websites, the new web you surf physical reality. This is true multimedia and the internet is enriched with services. Don't think of the internet as a bunch of websites. Think of it as a global computational platform. It's a computer. And every time you go on it and you do a Google search or post something on Pinterest or do a mashup, you're programming this computer. Humanity is building this historic machine. And this machine enables us to collaborate together in new ways. Now the second big change, who here has kids under the age of 34? Hands, please. Well done. Uh, I was in Italy recently, asked that question, nobody put up their hands. I was, I was tempted to say, you know what, let's just end this lecture right now, go home, light a candle, get, get some music on, have a bottle of wine, make some babies. You know, but anyway, I started studying kids as a generation when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all this sophisticated technology. It was about 20 years ago, and at first I thought, my children are prodigies. And, uh, but then I noticed that all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So I started working with these 300 kids, and I wrote this book back in 1997. And I, and I came up with these terms, the net generation, the digital divide. And, and uh, flash forward to today, these kids are not just growing up digital, they've grown up. They have no fear of technology, because it's not there. It's, it's like the air. It's like I have no fear of a refrigerator. It's not technology to me. And there's no more powerful force to change every institution than the first generation of digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. This is the baby boom echo. Those of you who put up your hands, if your kids are between the ages of 13 and 33, you are baby boomers, and they are your children. And uh, this is the biggest generation. There's 80 million of them in the United States. Based on their demographic muscle alone, they'll dominate the 21st century. But what makes them a real force for change? You know what? This is the first generation to come of age in the digital age. Now, this is a cartoon from Growing Up Digital 15 years ago. When I put this slide on the screen back then, people would be falling off their seats. They'd be laughing so hard. Now everyone looks at it like, What's that weird thing? Why isn't he using an iPad or something like that? <laughs> and time online is not taken away from hanging out with your friends, learning the piano, talking to your parents, or doing your homework, time, or interacting socially. I think Sherry Turkle has done wonderful research, and she's made a great contribution, and it's totally sensible that we all need to figure out how to integrate this into our lives. But I'm not as concerned, because Kids today, when they're interacting, that's taken away from television. And kids come home. You know your own kids. They turn on their computer. I used to turn on the TV, and I was the passive recipient. They turn on the computer, and they're in three different windows, and they're listening to iTunes and texting, maybe talking on the phone, unlikely. Uh, they get three magazines open and uh, a video game. Oh, yeah, and they're doing their homework. And, uh, <laughs> The computer may be going on in the background. The computer, or sorry, the television is going on in the background. The television is sort of like Muzak, right? And when they're online, what are they doing? Well, rather than being the passive recipients of somebody else's video, they're reading, they're organizing stuff, they're authenticating, they're telling their stories, they're composing their thoughts, they're having to remember things. This is affecting brain development. And I did a $4 million research project where we interviewed 11,000 youngsters in 10 countries, and I've come to the conclusion this is not bad. Overall, in a family, with good parenting or in a good school, this is something that's enormously positive. And these kids have brains that are more appropriate for the 21st century. I think that we fear what we don't understand. This is a 
panel ex example. I interview these kids sometimes. It was a World Congress in IT, big crowd like this, probably five, 6,000 people. And uh, out of the mouths of babes, on the left there is Rahaf Harfouche. She's studying in Paris, her boyfriend's in Toronto. They're apart for a week, so they turn on video Skype to keep their relationship going. They cook together across the Atlantic Ocean. And I said to her, Rahaf, your generation, do you use email? And she says, oh no, Mr. Tapscott, email is yesterday's technology. And I said, well, if you did use email, what would you use it for? She says, email, that's sort of like a formal technology, say for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. That would be a good use <laughs> of email. Two down from her, that's Sherry Kong. She, she's a 20-year-old 20, 20 student in New Zealand, hired with 80 other students by the government. Their job? To teach the teachers how to use the internet in the classroom. Generation lap, right? I asked her, Sherry, what are the teachers like as students? She says, oh, Mr. Tabscott, they're awful. The teachers, they talk in class. They don't do their homework. <laughs> and sitting beside her is uh, the granddaddy of them all, Michael Furtick. I've known Michael since he was 13. Uh, when he was the project manager on my website, growingupdigital.com. Uh, they made him the project manager as a 13-year-old because he was the oldest. And um, <laughs> when Michael was 15, his own site was getting 20 million page views a month. And so he sold it for an undisclosed seven or eight, um, uh, uh, seven or eight figure US dollar sum. So he's a wealthy youngster. One of the news reports said it was probably only a million dollars. And I sent him an email, I said, Michael, you sold it for a million dollars, you should have called me. And he wrote back and he says, Don, legally, I can't tell you how much I sold it for, but I can tell you I'm very happy. And um, he didn't want the money to buy a Ferrari, although he bought a cheap little car, but his mom had to drive around because <laughs> he only had his learner's permit. Um, he wanted the money to invest in his next new venture. It's called takingitglobal.org. You know what? The kids are all right. Academically, the top third are doing spectacular. Graduating like never before. It's never been tougher to get into the best schools. Um, standardized scores have not fallen. They should because everybody takes them now. The middle third are pretty good. The bottom third are dropping out of school. But there are real problems with the schools. I was in Wisconsin recently. The class size is going up to 55. You know, to blame the internet for that bottom third is it's like blaming the library for ignorance. This is not a failing of technology or how we use it. It's a failing of public policy. So if you're building a company, a marketing program, a government, a democracy, a school, whatever, these are the eight norms of the generation. They want freedom. Freedom is like choice. Um, and choice is like oxygen. I had three media choices as a kid. They want to customize everything. I never got to customize the Mickey Mouse Club when I was a kid. They're a generation of scrutinizers. They see a picture. When I saw a picture, it was a picture. They see a picture, what is it? A morph, an animation, a bot, a Photoshop? It's a generation with very strong values. Oh, they don't give a damn. Actually, youth volunteering has been growing in the United States in high schools and universities year over year for 15 years. The percent of kids that don't do drugs or alcohol, that are clean in high school schools, has been going up year over year for 15 years. We can be very hopeful about them generation of collaborators. They want to have fun. They think that work, learning, collaborating, and having fun are all the same thing. They're a generation of, that wants speed, not immediate gratification. They just have legitimate expectations that things should happen faster. And a generation of innovators. Third thing, you put those two together and you get a social revolution. Now, it's not just that there are close to a billion people on Facebook, or what, 400 million now on Twitter. Social media is not about hooking up online. It's becoming a new means of production. Social media is beginning to change the way we orchestrate capability in society to do things. Now, I'll just give you a, a, a quick example. Self-organization. Barack Obama figured this out four years ago, and that's what got him elected. He changed the way you conduct elections. Did he change the way we govern? Or do we still have the industrial age model? You vote, I rule. I don't think he did, and I think that hurt him a lot. 
especially with young people. But here's my story. I mean, it was kind of humbling. So about five years ago, somebody sent me an email saying, you know this guy, the senator from Illinois? He thinks your book, Wikonomics, is the key to winning the presidency and transforming America. Go to mybarackobama.com. So I went there. There's my book. Right on the screen, it says, we believe in the principles of transparency and use of the internet every way possible in the book Wikonomics by Don Tapscott. And he says, I'm asking you to believe not just in my ability to bring about real change in Washington. I'm asking you to believe in yours. And I, I looked at this thing, and well, my first reaction was, I am the man. But not so fast, Don, because it turns out I'm not the man. Because I looked around, there was sure there was a Wikonomics community. There was also a young firefighters in New York community. And there was a single moms for daycare for Obama community. He created a platform whereby 35,000 communities self-organized, and that's what brought him to power. That's what raised $100 million. This is a revolutionary force, if you can figure it out. And I use that term advisedly. Now, there's this big debate on social media and its role in social change. And I participated in it. A friend of mine, Malcolm Gladwell, took the other point of view. And then the debate got settled by a single word, Tunisia. Then it had another word, Bahrain, and another word, Egypt. And it ended up with a dozen more words. Now, it's not that social media caused the Tunisian revolution. It was caused by injustice and by young people who didn't want to be treated as subjects. Social media didn't create the revolution. It was created by a new generation that wanted hope. But the media was key. Just like it drops transa transaction and collaboration costs for you in business, it drops the costs of dissent, of rebellion, and, and even of insurrection. Do you know during the Tunisian revolution, snipers were killing unarmed students in the streets. So the kids would take their mobile device, take a picture, geolocate the snipers, send that to a friendly military unit that would come in and take out the snipers. You think social media is hooking up online? For these kids, it was a military tool for self-defense. Up until six months ago in Syria, if you were injured in a demonstration, you went to a hospital, you'd go in with a broken leg, and you'd come out with a bullet in your head. So these two 20-somethings created an alternative emergency health care system using Twitter. That you were, if you were injured, the tweet was geolocated, van would pick you up, take you to a makeshift medical clinic where doctors gave you medical aid rather than killing you. Now, of course, there are lots of problems with this. It's ugly and it's complicated. Up until two years ago, all revolutions in human history had a leader or a leadership that could take power. These wiki revolutions happened so fast that they create a vacuum, and politics abhors a vacuum. But you know what? The arc of history is a positive one. And the train has left the station. The cat is out of the bag. The horse is out of the barn. Help me out here. The toothpaste is out of the, we're not going back on this. Social media and social network and collaboration is creating a more open world. Now to get down to you, it's also changing the deep structure and architecture of a corporation. Throughout the 20th century, we created wealth by vertically integrated companies. And 80 years ago, a Nobel Prize winning economist named Ronald Coase asked a deceptively simple question. He said, why does the firm exist? If Adam Smith is right in the open market's the best mechanism to determine how goods and resources and information is allocated. Why, why do you work for companies? Why isn't everybody as an independent contractor at every step along the way in production? And he said the answer is, and he won a Nobel Prize for saying this, the answer is transaction costs. Now he defined that broadly. He meant the cost of collaboration, the cost of search, he said, this is 80 years ago, search in an open market of finding all the right information to people to do something totally prohibitive. We bring it inside the boundaries of a corporation where you have filing cabinets to find information and org charts to find people. The big industrialists understood this, and Henry Ford had within the boundaries of the Ford Motor Corporation a power plant, steel mill, shipping company, glass factory. Why? Because the cost of transactions in an open market were greater than the cost of doing things inside the boundaries of the Ford Motor Company. Well, along comes 
modern air travel and telephony and facsimile in the early days of IT, and the boundaries of the corporation started to become more porous. I wrote a book, um, some of you may know, it's like 20 years ago now, called Paradigm Shift, where I said, the enterprise is becoming extended. Then we saw the rise of the internet, where vertically integrated companies began to unbundle into focus companies that work within networks, and they competed better. Now, what's happening today is that transaction costs are dropping so much that peers can come together and create value. Peers in the sense of peers within your company cutting across the old silos. Peers in the sense of companies acting as peers rather than as superiors and subordinates in a supply chain. And the really crazy one is peers outside the boundaries of companies. So think about it. If you can create a encyclopedia with a million people, it's in 240 languages, it's 20 times bigger than Britannica, it's real time, but the error rate's about the same, and nobody owns it. What else could you create? Could you create a, a computer operating system through peer production? Well, the Linux operating system is now the dominant operating system in the world for medium and large computers and mobile devices. Nobody owns it. Linux recently announced some big new customers. One was China. Imagine that, you're a salesperson. Hey, boss, got a big new customer. A lot of users, a lot of users. Could you create a physical good? Well, the Chinese motorcycle industry has dozens of little companies. They all cooperate together. They meet in tea houses and on the internet. There's no OEM. There's no Harley Davidson pulling all the strings. This is now 40% of global motorcycle production. So let me give you an example of this. Change to the architecture of wealth creation. This guy on the screen, his name is Rob McEwen. The reason I know this story is because he's my neighbor. <laughs> he lives across the street. He moved across the street and he held a cocktail party to meet the neighbors. And he says, you're Don Tapscott. I read some of your books. I said, great, what do you do? And he says, well, I used to be a banker and now I'm a gold miner. He's a funny guy. He introduces his wife and says, my wife, she's a gold digger. But uh, <laughs> thankfully, I know her well, she's not. She's enormously capable and has a sense of humor. But um, anyway, he tells me this amazing story. He takes over this gold mine in northern Canada. His geologist can't tell him where the gold is. He gives him more money to get more geological data. They come back, they can't tell him where to go into production. After a few years, he's so frustrated, he's ready to give up. But one day, he has an epiphany. He wonders, well, if my geologists don't, where the, don't know where the gold is, maybe somebody else does. So he does a radical thing. He takes his geological data, which is the biggest secret in the mining industry. He publishes it and holds a contest on the internet called the Gold Corp Challenge. It's basically half a million dollars in prize money for anyone who can tell me, do I have any gold? And if so, where is it? He gets submissions from all around the world. They use techniques that he's never heard of, and for his half a million dollars in prize money, Rob McEwen found $3.4 billion worth of gold. The market value of his company went from 90 million to $10 billion. We had dinner with Rob and his wife last week. The market value of Gold Corp today is $36 billion, and I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, he's a happy camper. <laughs> he peered. He found the uniquely qualified minds outside the boundaries of his corporation. And in doing so, he increased the value of his company by two orders of magnitude. So this is why we're all sitting here wondering, what do I need to do? What's going on? These four big drivers for transformation. There's another one, of course. The global economic crisis created a burning platform. We have to change. You know the, the idea of burning platform, you're somewhere where the costs of staying where you are become significantly greater than the costs of moving to a new place, something perhaps radically different. We need to do this now. So let me uh, pull this together for you. Five principles for the transformation of the enterprise. Implement these. Collaboration, openness, sharing, interdependence, and integrity. First, collaboration. I'm not talking about a bunch of people getting together in a nice room having a meeting. I'm talking about collaboration that can now occur because of the internet on an astronomical scale. 
Procter & Gamble's looking for a molecule that'll take red wine off a shirt. They got 8,000 chemists inside their boundaries and a million and a half outside that they can now get to. Sure enough, there's a retired chemist in New York or a grad student in Taipei comes up with a molecule, PNG pays them a few hundred thousand dollars. Finding the uniquely qualified minds, I call this an idea agora. You know the Roman and Greek agora? These are agoras for ideas, markets for uniquely qualified minds. And you can now do, create your own innovation ecosystem with companies like Inno360. Full disclosure, I'm um, an investor in this company. You can turn your consumers into producers, or as we call them, prosumers. Threadless is a clothing company where their products are designed by their customers, and they never make anything until there's a big enough market. Enormously, enormously profitable company. The final chapter of Wikonomics was a wiki. It was written by 1,500 people. You can even get your customers to create your own advertising. Now, in, do you know about the Super Bowl crash, the Super Bowl contest for Doritos? Anybody know about this? Not really. Well, I'm going to show you a couple of ads. Doritos said to its customers, you create an ad for the Super Bowl, and we'll put the good ones on. So this ad was created by two young women who were nobodies. They're now somebodies. And it actually ran on the Super Bowl. Can we roll the video, please? Paper plastic. Paper's fine. I like these. Oh, nacho cheese. Old school. Fiery habanero? Yeah! Those are hot! Huh? Oh. Salsa verde. Oh! oh. <laughs> Blazing buffalo and ranch? Giddy up! Gonna need a clean up on register six. Now, as you can imagine, some of the ads that came in were a little too, uh, how do I say this, edgy to go on the Super Bowl. But one of the more edgy ones actually made it on the Super Bowl. Let's run that now. I mean, what ad agency is going to dress somebody up in a mouse suit and have them beat up your customer? But you turn your customers into producers, and it turns out that they create ads that really work for the Doritos demographic. How about this? You can peer produce the most complicated product I can think of, a next generation aircraft. Now, the 787 Dreamliner had some problems, but the CEO of Boeing said, because it was the first time to do this, he said, aircraft will never be produced the old way. The old way, you had a spec, 20,000 pages, and you put it out to a supply chain, and then you beat up on your suppliers, and you assembled the aircraft. Boeing said, no, you're not suppliers, you're peers. You make the engine, the fuselage, the electronics, the entertainment systems. We're going to give you a 20-page document describing what we'll try and achieve here, and then let's co-innovate and co-create this aircraft. The Boeing 787 Dreamliner is more back orders than any aircraft ever. When you're flying at 36,000 feet, it'll affect your body like you're at 1,500 feet, bone density and stuff like that. And it uses a quarter less fuel. This is called competitive advantage through a networked business model. Then we have all this internal collaboration as well. If electronic mail is a great technology for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents, how do you get beyond that? What are these new suites? Now, a full disclosure, this is a company I've invested in. I always do that. But you know, these have their industrial strength social networks. They have wikis, blogs, jams. You create new teams, projects, ideation, digital brainstorms, challenges like Rob McEwen did. Google's coming out with a great suite as well. This is the new operating system for the 21st century business. And if you're tired of email, you got to move to these new platforms. Organizations that do, my research shows, they perform better. They compete better. 
Theme number two, I'm going to pick it up here, is openness. People think about WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. No. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Basically, every company is becoming naked. This is a book I wrote 10 years ago that my mother also bought most of the copies of. But um, you're being scrutinized like never before. And if you're going to be naked, there are some corollaries that flow from that. One is fitness is no longer optional. You know, if you're going to be naked, you better get buff. Meaning you need to have good value because value is evidence like never before, but you also need to have the values of integrity. This is now happening to the point, TED Global this year, and I, I, I uh, uh, spoke at it, the theme of the entire thing was radical openness. So how should you be opening up with your customers, with your business partners, shareholders, suppliers, because good things can happen? Theme number three, sharing. The old approach is we develop intellectual property and we own it. And if anyone tries to infringe it, we'll get out our lawyers and we'll sue them. Well, that doesn't work so well in a world where intellectual property is not atoms, they're bits. And, and, and when they become bits, they don't know all these rules like I, I should not be instantly replicated and communicated around the world at the speed of light through networks of glass. Um, so that old approach didn't work so well for the record industry, did it? They took a legal solution to a business model problem. And the industry that brought you Elvis and the Beatles is now collapsing. And it's being replaced by a new industry that understands the new paradigm that music shouldn't be a product, it should be a service. Spotify would be a great example. IBM gave away $400 million of software to the Linux movement. Why would they do that? created a platform on which they built a multi-billion dollar business. They saved themselves 900 million developing their own proprietary operating system. And they also, well, at the time, they got it to stick it to Microsoft, too. Probably not in that order uh, of importance. Nike has given away 400 patents about sustainability into the green exchange on the idea that a rising tide can lift all boats. Any of you from the pharmaceutical industry you know you're about to fall off this thing called the patent cliff, losing 20 to 35% of your revenue in the next year. Imagine that. What do you do? Cut back on office supplies? No. No. You need to change the whole model of research, embracing these principles. You know, we need a Linux of clinical trial data. Pre-competitive research should be shared. Failed results should be shared. There's all kinds of clinical trial data. And in doing so, we could save the industry and also start to create some real research that can advance medicine and human health. Theme four, interdependence. You know what? Business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And we need to have private companies, governments, civil societies, and, and you, individuals, can be the fourth pillar of society. Two kids in Boston can go onto the Ushahidi network during the Haitian earthquake and find a seven-year-old girl buried in the rubble. She's dying, she's been there for four days, she gets out a little text in Creole, and they tra uh, translate the text, they triangulate their location, they send in the authorities, her life is saved. So we can now all cooperate together in all kinds of new and exciting ways in terms also of solving global problems. I call them global solution networks, advocacy, operational networks that intervene in crises, governance networks that are governing something in the world but they're not based on states like I can. The internet is governed by a multi-stakeholder network. This is a time of vast new promise in the world. And finally, integrity. Integrity is about being honest, it's about being considerate of the interests of others, and it's about abiding by your commitments. And along with transparency, that's the foundation of trust. So baking these principles into your DNA and reorganizing your operation around them, we can move forward. Every one of these institutions, a contrast between stagnation of the old model on the one hand and rebirth, renewal, revitalization. 
You look at the world today and it looks depressing, but I've never been more optimistic that this is a time when we can bring about real important change. How's it gonna happen? Well, you get a paradigm shift, you get a crisis of leadership. These things cause dislocation, confusion, uncertainty. Vested interests fight against change and leaders of the old have great difficulty embracing the new. How is your company going to find leadership for change? Well, I've studied thousands of organizations. You know where leadership comes from? It can come from the top, and it's really good when that happens, but it can come from anywhere. Vice President, CFO. We documented a story of a secretary who was a critical person in the transformation, of a positive transformation of one of the biggest banks in the world, and she had what it took to be a leader. She willed it. Leadership is each of our personal opportunity, if we will it. So it's all complicated, but ultimately there's a very simple truth here. The end of a period in history, and with it, the need to rebuild a new set of institutions. And you got door number one and door number two. If you're tinkering, you're taking the wrong door. We need to dig deep and find a way to transform ourselves. Let me close by telling you about some research I've been doing on nature. Um, if we could run the video. Um, Anthony and I, towards the end of macroeconomics, started wondering, what does this age of networked intelligence look like? And we, fish come in schools and sheep come in flocks. Uh, do we have that video there? Would it be possible to run it? Um, starlings over the moors of England come in something called a murmuration. And throughout the, the cold winter nights, the starlings are out over a 20-mile radius. And they're doing their starling thing. They're foraging for food. And at night, they come together. And they create one of the most spectacular things in all of nature. Now, it's called a murmuration in reference to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. Scientists that have studied this have said they've never seen an accident. There's leadership, but there's no one leader. Now, the murmuration has a function. It warms the birds up for the cold night, and it protects the birds from predators. In some of these videos, you can see a hawk on the right of the screen, a predator being chased away by the collective power of the little birds. Now, is this some kind of fanciful analogy, or could we learn something from this? Well. Studying this thing, it really functions according to these principles I just described to you. It's a big collaboration. There's a huge openness and sharing of information about all kinds of stuff, not just speed, trajectory, danger, velocity. Um, and there are a bunch of rules that govern all that, the key one being don't bump into anybody else. But they're sharing in all kinds of other information about nesting and food sources and so on. This thing has a great interdependence. Just as I said, business can't succeed in a world that's failing. This thing functions as if the interest of the individual bird is somehow in the interest of the murmuration as a whole. And it has a great integrity that gives the birds the courage to take on, collectively, to take on a, a fearsome predator. So bear with me for a sec. Imagine, just work with me here, imagine if we could connect ourselves on this planet through these vast networks of, of glass and of air, that we could connect our brains somehow. Could we go beyond sharing information and sharing knowledge to start to share some kind of intelligence? Could we create some kind of consciousness that transcends beyond an individual or a community or an organization? If we could do that, we could do wonderful things. You know, Peter Senge talked about the learning organization. Maybe it never happened because organizations like people that aren't conscious can't learn. I mean, when I give talks, I try and be entertaining because I find people learn more when they're conscious. Um, <laughs> during the Egyptian Revolution, people said, Mubarak is too strong. The kids are going to give up. They'll go home. 
And I wrote, no, actually, they won't go home because if they do, he will hunt them down and he will kill them. Just as sure as this murmuration breaks up, the predators will have a field day. So I look at what's going on today in the, in the Arab world and other places, and I see something like this. And I see a model that could be the future enterprise as well. And I get a lot of hope that this, this age of network intelligence will be an age of, of promise fulfilled and of uh, peril unrequited. And maybe this smaller world our kids inherit might actually be a better one. Can we do this? Thank you. <laughs>